Uh, all is well. <laughs> Matthew chapter 26, and we will begin our reading with verse 36. The Bible says, Then come to Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And verse 37 says, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he said unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. Verse 39, And he went a little farther. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying oh my father if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not as I will but as thou wilt verse 40 and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and said unto Peter what could you not watch with me one hour Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep. What? Again, for their eyes were heavy, and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then came he to his disciples and said unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. I'm going to take my text this morning from verse number 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, your will be done. I'm going to preach a message this morning entitled, The Cup, The Cup. Just say those two words to a few folks around you. Just say the cup. Amen. Let us Bless your name, Jesus. I believe, you may be seated, I believe we have entered into a very crucial time in the body of Christ as the people of God. In essence, we have crossed over the threshold of the crucible. Well, now, where now we are going to enter into defining moments of destiny, not only as a corporate body of Christ, but in particular, every single person is going to walk into now a realm of reality where the things you've only dreamed about and things you've only thought about and the things you've only imagined become real in your life. It is essential that as we cross over this threshold into the crucible of time and transitions that God has inser inserted into time from eternity, that we walk into them right, that we walk into them correctly, sober, focused, centralized, that the core of your being rests in your faith in God, not in the fantasy of your mind. You must realize there's a difference in having faith in God and trusting in the fantasies that you have only conjured up in your analytical processes of wishing you were out of your situation. Matthew 26 is very interesting because it brings us to the pinnacle of prophetic purpose concerning the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. When you look at Matthew chapter 26, there are several things to note. 
But the words that stand out to me so specifically today, as I've studied for you and prayed for you, is these two words, the cup. How simple is that? The cup. Oswald Chambers said it on this wise, if God has made your cup sweet, drink it with grace. Hmm. If he has made it bitter, drink it in communion with him. See, Matthew 26 is important because we find Jesus in the finalities of a lot of things. This is the final Thursday of his life. He's actually faced a week of finalities. It's his final approach to Jerusalem, his final visit to the temple, his final trip to his favorite town, Bethany. As a matter of fact, he's preached his final sermon. He's partaken in his final supper with his disciples. He's in his final hour. And he faces two words. The cup. The cup is important. These words are listed throughout scripture. Psalm 116 verse 13 tells us there is the cup of salvation. Jeremiah 16 7 says there is the cup of consolation. When we cross over the intertestament period, Paul introduces us to a cup in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, and he calls it the cup of blessing. And then he gives a stark contrast in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, to the cup of devils. Matthew 26, in our chapter, verse 27, there is a cup that is called the sacramental cup, or the cup of communion with Jesus and his disciples. Psalm 116 or Psalm 11 and verse 6, I should say, says there's a portion to every cup. And then it denotes the one's, con one's condition in life, <clears throat> be it adverse or prosperous, <clears throat> denoting the idea that every cup has different ingredients. There's the cup of astonishment, the cup of trembling, the cup of God's wrath. One professor says that the cup is the vessel of the vine, Ivan. It's the vessel of the vine. I found that to be intriguing. The spiritual symbol of oblations and also outpourings, the cup. In modern times, in our day, there's, the cup represents a sense of achievement. There's the Stanley Cup. I could tell you of other things and sports concerning the cup, but it's it symbolizes achievement, accomplishment. But it can also represent an experience. A cup can represent an experience, also an assignment or a purpose. A deeper definition would be a cause or a reason or a matter. The cup. When we read our text, you can't get around this place where Jesus finds his cup. You know, you can't escape it. And as we approach uh, Golgotha now, in just a few weeks, we look at Calvary. We have to back up, rewind the tape a little bit, and find out what is going on with Christ and these guys that are following him, known as disciples, learners, students. And he takes them to a place, according to our text, John called Gethsemane. Now, anybody that has been following Christ for any amount of time, you already know what that means. It's the olive press. It's the place where the oil is squeezed out of the olive. You've been there yourself. You've gone through those seasons of pressure where you thought it was going to break you. But the more the pressure come on you, the more the anointing came out of you. You found yourself slipping through things that should have killed you. But you were so oiled down that the pressure could not break you. And it could not take you out. 
And all it did was just squeeze the best out of you. This is not a place that's unfamiliar to them. This is Gethsemane. This is a place the Bible says in John chapter 18 verse 2 that he resorted to this place often with his disciples. This is a place where they would just get away. This is a place where they would just go and escape. Evidently, they were so familiar with this place that it must have belonged to a friend. You know, one of those unknown people of the Gospels. Isn't it something how the unknown people of the Gospels always have some kind of significant impact in Christ's destiny? Who was the guy that owned the donkey? Who was the fella that owned the upper room? We don't know his name. And we don't know the owner of this place called Gethsemane, but they had access to it anytime they wanted it. And according to John 18 verse 1 now, it's in a specific location. The Bible says it's beyond the Kidron Valley. Why is that significant? Why is that so important? Why does John have to tell us the details of the location? That it's not just called Gethsemane, the olive press, but now he tells us it's just beyond the Kidron Valley. Well, you must understand that the word Kidron means obscurity. It means vagueness. It means the veil of darkness. In other words, there's a place you have to get to that's just the other side of vagueness it's just the other side of obscurity and some of you are wondering why you're going through this obscure season where everything seems so vague you want to see light and you want to see the diadem of illumination but you're faced every day with the veil of uncertainty and you're wondering what in the world is going on I thought it would be more clear than this and you don't know that you got to go through vagueness in order to get to your vision. You have to go through obscurity in order to get to the place where you can observe the goodness of God. We can't go around it. So Gethsemane now is located just beyond the Kidron Valley. Why is that important? Because 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 20 through 40 will tell you the first mention of the Kidron Valley is in relation to a young man named Josiah who burned all the altars that were built to Baal and the altars that were built to Ashtaroth and the altars that were built to the starry host of heaven. Why is that important? Because Baal means what man wants to do. Man's will. Man's doing. Man's philosophy. Man's ideas. And it is there that Josiah burned all these altars. So when when Jesus walks to Gethsemane, he walks across the ashes of what was built but had been consumed by a reformer in the earth that says we got to go a little bit further than this right here. We got to get beyond man's will. We got to get beyond man's idea. We got to get beyond man's analytical process. We got to get beyond man's philosophy. We got to get beyond man's intellect we got to get beyond man's learning we got to get into the realm that is past this valley of Kidron can I take it a bit further y'all I haven't preached in a few weeks and I caught my breath and now I feel like I might want to preach a little bit and I know it's spring break and I know it's early in the morning and I know everybody's tired from celebrating birthdays and vacations but you know I feel like preaching a little bit I feel I I feel like we need a little jump start. How about you? Touch your neighbor and tell him, watch out. Something's about to go off in this building. See, this is very important because the Kidron Valley is what the prophet Joel talked about when he said that multitudes, just multitudes, are stuck in the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's the same valley. It's also known as the valley of decision. That multitudes were stuck in the valley of decision. Stay with that thought. Multitudes stuck in the valley of decision. I told you at the preface of this message, we are at the crucible. We are at the crossroads of church history. We are in a very intricate position, y'all, and we've got to make it over because people now are trying to 
decide comes from two words to cut people are trying to decide now what to cut off and what to keep what should stay and what should leave we're making decisions now who counts who does not count what count what does not count where am I supposed to be where am I not supposed to be and now we're cutting things off and we're we're making decisions and God is making incisions and he's searching our heart to see what is in us and he wants to know what we are all about and he wants to show us us he wants to show you you and he's bringing us to this valley of decision can I get just a little bit of help in this building hey, amen that's all I need to write there. I don't need no more than that right there and then he, he says now now Joel says they stuck in the valley of decision and Jesus now comes to a place Fred that he has to make a decision he he's got to decide now am I going to go over here to this Gethsemane am I going to go to this place am I really ready to accept this cup am I really ready to receive this cup now don't look at me like uh, Jesus don't have a problem here because he is obvious that he's dealing with humanity and yet divinity is calling him the moment is dealing with him but destiny is pulling him the present is saying wait the future is saying come on and he split right down the middle and so he screams out in agony Lord if you can take this cup from me excuse me from this assignment just for a minute oh yeah no I know you you are so sanctified you never prayed like that but I have been there split right down the middle where I have to make a decision either I'm going all the way or I'm gonna stop right here and I'm and some of y'all are there today and Pastor Rick came by to tell you don't stop now you gotta walk through the veil of obscurity to get to the place of clarity don't be shocked that you in a valley valleys are part of your destiny high five three people and tell them you go in the right way baby keep on moving I'm ready now I have decided to go ahead and take this cup see this cup ain't just anybody's cup this is my cup I ain't asking you to take my cup I gotta take my cup the Bible says he went a little farther which means he took three that could go this far but he had to go a little farther I don't know if you hear me right there but in order for you to get to the place you're supposed to be in God you always have to be willing to go a little farther than everybody else who is with you that's what makes you a leader Oh, see, this cup is his cup because his cup is distinct from the cup. Hold on, y'all. Just 12 verses ago, he's telling his disciples, divide this cup among you. This is a cup of communion. 12 verses earlier, Mother Hayes, he's got another kind of cup, and it's a shared cup. It's the cup of community. It's the cup of communion. And Beverly, when he tells them to take it, he says, y'all drink all of it. We which means if you're going to drink from the same cup as your brother, you can't just take your brother in here in your life and be a part of his life when everything's good in his life. No, you got to drink all of me if you want a part of me. In other words, if we're really in communion, you got to accept me when I'm down and you got to accept me when I'm up. You got to accept me when I'm in dark and you got to accept me when I'm in light. You can't just walk out on me based on your preference because we have have covenant but now this cup is different now that's the cup he said divide it among yourselves all of you drink from the same cup but he said now I got to go deal with a cup that has nothing to do with you see there is a time in life where people help you with your cup but then there's a time in life where you got to go a little farther where well, you have to go and drink your cup by yourself. But you've got to understand the etymology of this particular passage to get the depth of the content of what I'm trying to relate to you. So when he goes farther, the word is interesting because it means to go onward, watch now, or to precede or to go before. So he didn't just go beyond them, he went before them. In other words, if you going to lead, you got to go where your other folks are going before they get there. 
There's a cup that you must drink that you have to taste before anybody else can taste it. Are y'all in this building? Until you're willing to drink the cup of suffering first, until you're willing to be the first to sacrifice, then why in the world do you think everybody following you ought to be sacrificing? Preach, Pastor. What separates leaders from people with titles and positions is sacrifice, surrender, submission to God's will. Why are you asking us to do something you ain't doing yourself? I need you to high five three people and tell them Bishop's talking to us today. So even while he, they, they not partaking with him, watch them. He's praying, they sleeping. And he don't get it. He's praying, they sleeping, and he don't get it. I'm gonna say it now, Jesus ain't getting it. He, go, he expected to find them praying. He said, what? Have you ever walked up on your companions and you trying to do one thing, they doing another thing, put your hand on your hip and say, what? He's praying, they sleeping. I don't know why he's so surprised because it wasn't many days ago, they in a storm, they praying and he's sleeping. And they said, what? Isn't this something? That Jesus walks up to these guys, he says, what? Could you not watch? He didn't even ask them to pray. Read the Bible right. He just said, watch. But when he come back and found them sleeping, he said, y'all have to add prayer to your watch because y'all sleeping on me. Let me tell you something. People that can't pray with you cannot watch with you. Bump your neighbor and tell him, pray while you watch, baby. Pray while you watch. I'm going to go ahead and and, and hit this real quick and we're going to be out. Because now watch what he says. He walks up on them. Y'all can be seated. And uh, he he says, when he he takes them there, Pastor Norris, verse 36, he says, sit here, watch now, while I go and pray. Is that what it says, verse 36? Verse 39, he fell on his face and what did he do? He prayed. Verse 42, he went away again the second time and prayed. Verse 44, left him again. TJ went away the third time and what did he do? Pray the same words. Now don't get him messed up because the first two times he prayed, he didn't pray the same words. First time he prayed, he said, Lord, if it be your will, take this cup from me. The next time, the second time he prayed, he said, Lord, I can see that you're not going to take it from me. Now, let me ask you a question. What happens to you when you pray and God don't answer? Sometimes it's so hard for people to accept his will. Guess what, honey? If he's saying nothing, he's saying no. Oh, y'all don't like that, do you? Because y'all believe that thing that if you pray, he gonna give it to you. Well, I came by to notify you. He's not your heavenly Santa Claus. And he's not your cosmic bellhop. So you ain't gonna just stand up and tell him give it to you and he gonna give it to you. Because he knows what you do not know. So why would he give you something you do not need? Because if you had it, it would destroy where you going. Some of y'all need to rest on some of your prayer. Because God knows better than you and he wants you to have it, he'll give it to you. It might not be that you're never going to have it. It just might be you not ready to receive it. Because you've not gone far enough. You ought to bump your neighbor and tell him, pray now. Pray and watch. Accept. Pray and do what? Now watch what he says. Mark 14, 36. This is Mark's version. He says, Abba, Father. He didn't just say Father. Not Mark. Mark heard him say Abba, Father. It's a Greek term when a child is in trouble calling for his daddy. Now let me ask all you daddies something in here. If your child was in trouble and he cried, Daddy, help me, would you just leave him there? 
No, you would not. You would respond to him. Am I right about it? Now watch what he says. Take the cup. Now let me ask you this. How many of you daddies have ever had your child ask you for something you know they didn't need? Because it was not time for them to receive it. Y'all ain't liking this, but I'm going to stay on here. Y'all so used to this word of faith thing, it's got your mind jacked up. So he said, now wait. Y'all forgot that he said, if you ask anything according to my will. Sometimes your will don't match. That's why he said, not my will. Some of you ladies need to quit praying about that man. I'm going to leave it there. Amen. He said, hmm, Lord, Lord, Lord. <laughs> he said, if it be possible, verse 39 of our text, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. Y'all can do whatever you want to with that, you know, try to rationalize, generalize, whatever you want to do. But here's the deal. He didn't want it. This is low down real right here. He didn't want it. He said, now listen, if, you, if we can save humanity... Without me dying, let's do it like that. That's what he prayed. And then he, and then he said, if you can get glorified without me going through this cross, let's do it like that. And God said, no, for my purpose to be accomplished, you're going to have to walk through this cup. You're going to have to walk through this lot. You're going to have to deal with this line. You're going to have to handle this business. And some of you want God to get glory. And you want to affect a lot of people with your life. But you're trying to get by the cup. You can't get by the cup. You have to deal with the cup. Everybody has to go to Gethsemane. And everybody has to deal with two words, the cup. Look at your neighbor and ask them, how are you handling the cup? I'm breaking it down. I'll leave, it, leave you alone with, with you. Have y'all ever, this, let me ask you, have you ever prayed, Lord, is there another way? Let me ask one more time. Have you ever been honest enough with God and said, God, is there another way that we can do this? And God just, he said, no. There's only one way we can do this. You're going to have to go through this time. You're going to have to deal with this season. And you're going to have to handle this situation. Because if you don't, others won't know how to get there. So the question is, why do you have your cup? Because Very simple. God trusts you. Bring me one of them cups, please, brother. The next time you look at your cup, quit complaining. Stop complaining about your cup. Because let me tell you something, Pastor Brandon, God trusts you with that cup. He trusts you, Carlos, with that cup. What are you doing with your cup? Many of you have set it down. Many of you have walked away from it. Why am I emphasizing this? Because in this cup is cause, purpose, reason, assignment, the details of destiny. The writer of Psalm 75 and verse 8, Elder Whitley said it like this. For in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup. Watch what he says. And the wine is red. It is full of mixture. Watch now. And he pours out of the same. 
What do you mean? He pours the mixture out to every person. How many of you would love to decide what's in your cup? I have a little trick I pull on people. Stacy knows about this. When they come to my house, I love doing this because I offer them all a cup of cranberry juice. Cranberry juice. I drink it every day because it's good for my kidneys. Yes, yes. Cranberry juice. Who would not want to drink a cup of cranberry juice? Everybody, everybody, everybody likes cranberry juice, right? It's sweet, it's red, just pull it up. But my cranberry juice, TJ knows, is just a tad different than everybody else's cranberry juice. Why is that, Bishop? Because my cranberry juice is organic. It's fresh pressed. No additives, no sugar is right out the berry. And let me tell you, when you drink fresh pressed cranberry juice, you do not smile. You cringe. And I love to see their faces, Brandon, when they taste my cranberry. And they look mad at me like, I got the first thing. I pull it on Pastor Dick Burnell. You should have seen him. I said, Pastor, I want you to partake in my cup with me. He said, what is it? I said, cranberry juice. I drink it every morning. He said, I love cranberry juice. I said, I do too. It's a wonderful drink. Clear your kidneys right up. Make you feel good. Pour him a cup. Pour me a cup. Slide him a cup. Give him a little toast. And down the cranberry juice. And I know what's coming. But he don't. He took two steps backwards. He's spitting everywhere, throws the cup down, and he says, Rick Hawkins, that's the worst stuff I've ever tasted in my life. And I said, I know. Now watch. He had a preconceived idea. We all do. We all think we ought to be able to fill our cup up with what we want to taste. But the Bible says there's a mixture in every cup. Y'all don't hear me. Let me tell you what I do with mine. I'll stop. I'll stop. I know you're getting bored. I don't want to bore you. Listen, with mine, Elder Whitley, I pour the fresh-pressed organic cranberry juice. Then I get me a little aloe vera juice, and I pour it in there with it, and I mix it. Well, you can't tell the aloe vera is in there with the, with the cranberry. It all looks the same. It's clear. It just mixes together real nice. You can't even tell I changed it but I put a little aloe vera in there too. Why? Just because I think it's healthy. But then, on top of that, now, I get me some flaxseed oil. Don't miss this. And I put the flaxseed oil in there with that. And now, when I stir it, it don't matter, Pastor Norris, how much I stir it, that flaxseed oil going to float to the top. Stands out clear above the cranberry juice looks down at the cranberry juice says i got clarity you gonna follow me can i tell you that in your cup god got your anointing oil resting on top of everything else so no matter what dregs are in the bottom of your destiny if you let the oil go first then the dregs don't taste so bad I need somebody to stand up and high five your neighbor and tell them there's a mixture in every cup. I'm sorry, you don't get to choose your drink because God's got your cup in his hand and he pours in your cup just what he knows you need. And it's not always sweet and it's not always pleasant and sometimes it shocks you into awareness. Let's stand. God is good. Amen. Amen. If Christ does not take the cup, he misses the cross. If he misses the cup, he exits his cause. Many of us want to go around the cup. King. There's a mixture in every cup. It's kind of like that scripture that we all love. 
For we know that all things are mingled together, working together for the good of those that love God and are the called, what? According to his purpose. You don't get to choose the ingredients. You don't get to write your chapters. You accept them. And you say, Lord, your will be done. And some of you are in a season of dealing with a bitter cup right now. And you're going through a rough time. It's got you cringing. But I prayed for you this morning. Because I knew this word would be for you. And I came by to tell you, drink it all. Drink it all. Bump your neighbor and tell them, drink it all. Because it's working for you. It's making you a better person. It's making you a better person. A healthier person. A more complete person. I tell a short story in close. Oh, I've done well. I've done well. I'm proud of myself. What do you think, Josiah? That's pretty good, right? Yesterday, I spent the last three days, most of my day sitting on, a, on, my, on my motorcycle, just riding. Three days, hours and hours. I tried to find the Samson's, because I read on your Facebook, y'all was telling, y'all was going where God told you to go on your Harley. So I say, Lord, tell me where to go. May we meet up. But the Lord must have told y'all to go somewhere else. <laughs> Dustin and Demara were behind me in, my, in, the, in the Jeep, and we was going to go eat these crawfish this certain place, and it just, just messed up situation. It was all good. So we, we come on back, and I was coming through Bernie, where I live. Y'all excuse me. Lo and behold, there's a lady walking in the middle of the street. If you know anything about Bernie, it's four lane through the town. And she's on that yellow line. And she's walking it like this. And traffic's just going by her. And I'm coming toward her on my bike. And she's look, and I can see she's bawling, crying. And she did like that. Like she was going to jump in front of me. And then she did it to the Jeep. And then I was watching my rearview mirror. She was doing it to every car. And the Lord said, turn around now. So I went down. I, I turned around. I came back. Parked my bike in the middle of the road. She was obviously a little disturbed mentally. But saint, but crying. I said, what is your name? She told me her name. I said, what are you, what are you doing? And she said, I, I want to die. I want to die. I'm going to jump in front of one of these cars. I'm going to die. Dustin now pulled up. He gets out. He's got the flashers on. He said, Dad, what's going on? I said, she's dealing with something. I said, ma'am, I want you to take my hands. She jumped back, started screaming, no, no. She said, I, I, I want my head off. I want to die. She's just bawling. I said, no, 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 no. I reached and grabbed her hands. I said, follow we walked across down the traffic and stopped get to the sidewalk I said what's wrong with you listen listen to her she said he don't love me 
he don't love me and I want to die. I put my arm around her. She pulled it back. I pulled her. I said, he loves you. She said, you don't know him. I said, yes, I know him. I said, God loves you. She lost it. Long story short, the cops show up. It's basically the end of this story. I got on my bike. I rode off. And I thought, you never know what mixture people are enduring. You don't know. You don't know. She's alone by herself. And I thought about Jesus being by himself. He's, Allison, he's saying, Father, do it another way. Disciples, y'all sleeping on me? Have you ever felt that alone? I have. Can you do this another way? Does anybody care? Have you ever been there? And I saw that in that lady, John. Her husband finally came out. I said, do you beat your wife? He screamed at me, no. I said, you better thank God. Because if she told me you hit her, I would mess you up right now. Because I don't believe in hitting women. I said, you better thank God. And she started screaming, he, he mentally abuses me with words. That's when I say, Lord, let the authority show, show up. They showed up and I walked out. But you don't know what's going on in that living room. See the person standing next to you? You don't know their thoughts. You don't know what they're dealing with. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? I came to tell you individually. I don't know where you are in your life. Lift your hands. But you're going to make it. You're not going to jump in front of an oncoming car. You're not going out like that. This is your word. Come here to me right now. You're dealing with obscurity. Come up here right now. You're dealing with vagueness and you want clarity. Come up here right now. You say, Pastor, I needed this word desperately for my life. Come up here right now.